and still hanging in there after a one night of Anglican action. Uh, there's a lot ahead, so pace yourself, hydrate, all that good stuff. Um, so I'm Mark Stanislav. I work for Duo Security. We are a two-factor vendor of uh, this crap uh, that hopefully at the end of it you'll actually be using and it's like on your keyboards, frankly, installing like two-factor of some sort. Uh, that would be a, that would be a best-case scenario. Um, uh, this this presentation, however, is agnostic. I talked about a lot of competitors, a lot of vendors, a lot of technologies, a lot of standards. Um, so if you're worried about a vendor presentation, I've never done one in my life. I, today's not going to be the day of PenguinCon that that happens. So two-factor itself, um, ho hopefully the, a little bit of this is review. If not, uh, that's great. That's even better. Uh, so factor classes are basically the breakdown of where two-factor com comes from. So most of us deal with single-factor authentication or single-factor other forms of um, uh, security. Mo uh, traditionally, a username and password. So your username is something kind of public or uh, very guessable, very easy to know. And then your password is supposed to be your super secret awesome thing. However, every year we see new reports that still password123 or whatever terrible password is still the same number one password when we see breach data from all the places that do get breached. Um, one thing that isn't changing is that breaches are happening. Another thing that's, that isn't changing are your passwords when you sign up for services online are not being protected well. That's a, that's a much harder challenge. Hey, John. Hey. Uh, that's a much harder challenge to solve. Uh, what you can do is you, as the end user, the consumer, can decide to hopefully use services, whether it's a bank, whether it's a social network, that support um, you know, an additional factor of authentication. Now, if you, how many people, and maybe let's go way back, how many people ever had a RSA Secure ID token on their keychain for work? Okay. Oh, man, this is an awesome crowd, actually. That's fantastic. Um, uh, so, still going, still going. Um, so, you know, uh, we'll, talk, we'll talk a little bit more about history soon, but for most people, when they think two-factor, if you're old, either corporate, uh, gov government, or otherwise, it's probably either a smart card or RSA security, if you think two-factor. Uh, in just the last few years, let's four, five, six years, the landscape of two-factor has changed dramatically. It's, it's changed so that the people that have been using the same technology for 30 years are like, what the hell, why couldn't we have had this 20 years ago? Um, now, in terms of what you guys deal with, most of you, if you do deal with two-factor now, it's probably in engaging in some sort of either hardware token or mobile device that has like a soft, uh, you know, soft token, an app that actually generates uh, one-time passwords, which we'll talk about. And then, of course, passwords and pins, that's a very common thing. Um, most of us haven't really dealt too much with you know, the biometric aspect, the, the fingerprints, the retina. Because of Touch ID these days, it's a lot closer to home than it was even like eight months ago or 12 months ago, right? Um, Touch ID still, however, doesn't have prevalence in terms of two-factor authentication because the SDK is not open to be, actually be used by developers to actually allow Touch ID to be used for anything other than the app store and unlocking your phone right now. Hopefully that'll change, we'll, we'll find out, right? Um, so any, any two-factor classes together makes two-factor. There's some really weird, uh, I, I mean, I've read posts from people that are security experts, allegedly, who say, like, uh, to be two-factor, it has to be a password and a, and a fingerprint. Not true. Any, any combination of factor classes yields two-factor. It's just counting. We're not, we're not making stuff up as we go. This is counting. So if you have one factor class plus one factor class, you have two factor classes. Um, so no, no magic, no, no myth there. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> what, really, what really matters here, and we'll talk more about some of the structures of authentication, but attackers might be really good at stealing passwords, but they probably aren't really good at going to your home and stealing your phone. Or they're maybe really good at going to a bar and grabbing your keychain off, off the table, but they're not really good at also manually milling your network connection and stealing your password. The, the trouble for attackers is usually when they're, when they're trying to own you, it's that they're doing it in one way. They're doing it either at a network level, at a physical level, or some other combination of you know, like grabbing your fingerprint off a glass at a bar, right? It, it's, it's very rare and very hard for an attacker to do both factor classes at one time to compromise your actual security. Uh, there's one trend I've been noticing that I'm not a fan of, which is people basically getting rid of passwords and just saying, oh, just use your phone, just authenticate with your phone. Don't, don't do two-factor, do single-factor, but use a phone. Okay, but you're still letting the attacker only have to own one thing. So you're, 
while two-factor, yes, there's going to be a lot of sexy things you'll hear about in terms of like marketing campaigns, like, oh, just get rid of passwords, never use a password ever again, there's a reason we still use passwords. It's because the complexity for an attacker is still way more effort than it is for you as a user. Even if it's a bad password, use a bad password and use two-factor, you're way better off in, in terms of an attack scenario. Oh, of course, American Express says I have a charge, thanks. Um, uh, and uh, the one thing, so I've done a lot of different security, I've been a penetration tester, I've done uh, infrastructure security, I've seen just about everything that I need to see in my life to be happy or sad about what I do. Threat scenarios change. The things and the ways and the concerns of an attacker change dramatically based on the target, right? You as an, as an everyday user of Facebook have almost no actual risk of someone trying to brute force your account password or trying to manually your connection at a Starbucks. That's just not practical and there's, no, there's not a lot of reason to do it. However, if you respond to that phishing email and click on that link and that steals your session out of Facebook, yeah, they might take your Facebook account and do something dumb with it, or try to get your, your friends to click on a link, whatever. Um, but when you're thinking about security, and you're thinking about two-factor, uh, certainly like a retina scan and a hardware token two-factor scenario is probably a little bit more than you need for your social media account, unless you're really important. She's is that a she or he? Sorry, she? Yeah. She's very important, so she has to have retina scans and hardware tokens. Um, uh, who has to deal with PCI DSS here? Okay. One sad, sad person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, extremely sad. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, PCI DSS um, uh, 3.0 just came out. Fun fact. It's not, it's not really in action until this coming year. Uh, but the, the important part is 2.0, 3.0, it doesn't really matter. There's a section specifically, 8.3, that talks about two-factor authentication. Um, we'll talk about some of the synonyms if you're, if you're thinking, well, not, you might not say two-factor. So um, basically, in terms of systems that are remote access into a PCI environment, you have to have two-factor authentication to satisfy 8.3. Um, now, as depending on where you go in your career, whether it's systems administration, development, security, whatever you guys might do in here, or just technology in general, um, this may be relevant, may not be. Uh, if you're in healthcare, um, uh, uh, with some constraints of, of uh, PHI concerns and everything else with HIPAA, uh, HIPAA is not as straightforward in terms of saying like you have to have this, 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 and this. However, there is there are sections in um, some of the HIPAA high tech stuff that do call out strong authentication, two factor, multi factor. A lot of people call it a lot of things. We'll get to that in a second. I promise. Another aspect to this, other than just being proactive about your own security, personal, professional, um, you know, when breaches do happen, when, it, when Adobe got compromised, their passwords got, that got dumped, and it turned out they were using a crazy mode of encryption, not password hashing, not um, key derivation, whatever. They were literally encrypting passwords, and they were doing it with ECB mode, which for the one cryptographer in here, you know, chuckle now, now's the chuckle time. Uh, but basically, your passwords were not safe by Adobe. Adobe failed at basic password security 101, okay? If Adobe can't do it right, how, how much do you really want to put your faith in that your password will ever be protected the right way, right? Adobe's been doing this for a lot of years. They have a lot of smart people, and they screwed up password security. Uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn got compromised, on and on. Like, compromises happen every other day. Uh, publicized or not publicized. The, the not publicized ones are the ones you should really worry about. Uh, and then we, th we see things like Heartbleed happen, right? Yeah. There's always going to be a risk to your account credentials. They're always going to happen. And two factors, one kind of simpler way to get around that concern being a all or nothing proposition for your security. Uh, a lot of lexicon crap. Like, you'll hear multi factor. Multi factor, as the word multi implies, is basically two or more. So it could be two factor, it could be three factor. Um, doesn't really matter. Two-factor is a type of strong authentication. Strong authentication, as defined by the powers that be, could actually be as simple as those password questions you fill out. Like, having password questions is actually a form of strong authentication. So, when people say, like, oh, we've implemented strong authentication, you probably want to clarify what that means to them, uh, because it might be really simple, like password questions, or it could be really complex, like a hardware token. Just, you know, think, think about that next time someone says strong. Um, You'll see 2FA, which is the most common abbreviation, uh, TFA or T-FA, all those things mean two-factor. 
Uh, Multi-factor, you'll see MFA a lot. Uh, Amazon Web Services, if you ever go in there and try to enable a two-factor like configuration, you'll see MFA. Google has really popularized the uh, moniker uh, two-step two verification or 2SV. There's a whole holy war around two-step versus two-factor. It's complicated and ugly. I would just go down the line just saying two-factor. It's more popular, it always will be. Um, by people. Um, but everyone has to have branding, right? So, uh, and a couple of people have adopted two-step as well, but two-factor still kind of kind of reigns supreme. Um, using a password and a PIN, if, if those are two known values, is not two-factor, okay? Uh, that's one common, yeah, go ahead. Why are you saying two-step is not two-factor? Because the way it works for me, at least, is I get something on my phone, plus the yeah. password I type in, that sounds like two-factor. So, so that's what I'm saying. Like All of these things, in my opinion, are all two-factor. Oh, okay. Google has made the differentiation that oh. there's two-step. And it has to deal with like threat modeling. Like, if your phone is your factor, and you're logging in on your phone with your password that's in, like in a password manager on your phone, technically it's two-factor, but it's still like the same like threat, I don't know. Two-factor, let's just go with two-factor. Uh, but password pin does not count. If you know both, both things, it's under the guise of what you know. So if it's what you have, what you know, and what you are, you can have as many what you want, what you knows as, in, as you want, or as many what you haves as you want, unless you mix them, that's not two-factor. Um, uh, cryptography is a huge component of two-factor. How RSA and secure ID tokens work, how Google Authenticator works, which a lot of you probably have, um, who has like Blizzard tokens for like World of Warcraft and stuff? Okay. Um, again, cryptography, crypt cryptography, cryptography. So um, luckily, you guys don't have to have to know a lot about cryptography to actually use two-factor. That's all done for you and on the background and no big deal. Um, and we're going to be talking mostly about just two-factor in the context of like log into a VPN, or log into a WordPress site, or logging into uh, SS you know SSH into a Linux box. We're not going to be talking about like banking two-factor. Um, uh, as you guys have probably already guessed, a PIN plus a debit card is two-factor, right? Yeah, what you have and what you know. So this is not a new concept, um, nor is what we'll talk about a little historically. In terms of open standards, this is clearly apropos for an audience at PenguinCon. Um, there is the Initiative for Open Authentication, or OATH. Um, so OAuth, as you guys might know if you're a developer, not the same thing as OATH. So, very bad acronym uh, overlap there. Uh, but basically, it's, it's a collaboration, big, big, big business collaboration to basically define standards around two-factor. So the first one that really came into, in, came into play is HOTP, so hash-based one-time passwords. Uh, the second one that came into play is time-based one-time passwords, the TOTP. Now, TOTP, the difference between HOTP and TOTP, and I think there's some other stuff to talk about here, but um, HOTP basically had a increment it would say one, two, three, four, five. So your server that was validating and your app or your, your mobile device or whatever the hell you were using would go one, two, three. Imagine what happens if one says four and the other one's like three and nothing happens, right? So you get out of sync and then it's always out of sync and you have to reset this, the, the value and then get back into sync. Uh, yeah, exactly. One, one other problem about HotP is um, like, when you generate a hot P one-time password, that value is good until the end of time or until the next hot P is authenticated to the server. So let's say an attacker does you know, sniff your network connection, intercepts your username, intercepts your password, and intercepts your one-time password because it's all going through the same network connection. They could actually like stop that connection at like Starbucks or whatever, just kill your, your TCP stream, stop it, and you're like, oh, this website must be broke. Don't worry about it. I'll go. I'll do it at home later. They have until they until you log in again to use that that one-time password. Top P, however, is the new hotness, and Top P works because it actually has a time window. Usually, six, 60 seconds, uh, 30 to 60 seconds is the normal time window. If that code is not used within that time window, it is no longer valid. So if an attacker steals one, unless they use it immediately, it won't be valid for them. So a little bit of an evolution there. Um, 
This is a little simpler to implement because this does require a, a clock source. You have to have like an NTP server and make sure there's not too much clock skew. Otherwise, cryptographic algorithms fall over very quickly. They, they don't like that. Um, so this is much simpler to implement. This is much safer to implement. Um, almost every token you buy now and almost every app you use, whether it's for like Guild Wars or it's Google Authenticator, it's probably using top people, just for reference. Um, so getting the thing we just talked about, top P, win of generation, um, no, no, no time need for uh, top P. Um, so if you use any of those services, and trust me, there's plenty, plenty more, but some of those, Google, Dropbox, Amazon Web Services, Facebook, Microsoft, Stripe, Dreamhost, and LastPass, all of those services and many, many more all have top P support which again is an open standard, which means you can download an app for free, whether you're on Blackberry or um, Windows Phone or iOS or Android or your desktop, and you can actually generate top P one-time passwords for all those services and add two-factor, I think for all, yeah, for all those for completely free. So if you want to protect any of those accounts, nothing is stopping you literally right now to set up and sign up. And, yeah. So I, the first time I set up a, a two-factor auth with Google, I thought, well, if you already have my Google password, you could just set up two-factor auth and lock me out of Google, and I would basically never, ever, ever get to get that account back, because you totally pwned it. Sure. Um, they could also just change like your recovery emails and stuff, too, and own your other accounts, I guess, but... Yeah, but I mean, you <laughs> to, like, yeah. I don't think you can reset all the recovery elements. It depends on the search. Google's, Google's a little bit more mature than right. a lot of companies are. Uh, but yeah, that, that's certainly... My question is, like, have you seen that attack in the wild? Like, it seems like if you're starting from an insecure... It, if, it, if it's an attack that we see, it's usually, like, like um, the Syrian Electronic Army doing crap like that. Like, they're taking accounts over to make a scene and then get rid of it. Like, right. Because at the end of the day, Google's still going to give you your account back. Right. right? So it's just, it's, it's, it might be an inconvenience, but it's such a rare thing. It's, so it's like, everything in security is risk versus convenience, right? You're adding security. The risk that that security control might be used against you before you actually use it is kind of like infinitesimal like of, a, of a concern, really. Um, if people want to lock you out of your account, they're going to make it a headache, but you're always going to get your account back unless there's some really terrible service you're working with. Uh, we saw the, uh, the at n account got compromised yeah, sure. with Twitter, I was thinking about that. right? But they still have their account back. It was, yeah, it was a bit of a drama. They got an awesome blog post with probably a lot of ad revenue from their blog. Uh, but other than that, they got their account back and everything's happy, so, yeah. Good, great, great uh, point, though. I mean, that, that's certainly a, a reasonable scenario that, that, that might happen. Um, uh, the cool thing is, again, open standard, build your own app. It can use top P. This is a very simple algorithm. There's actually a whole um, Oath toolkit that lets you very easily integrate Oath RFC standards, whether it's top P or top P, into your applications. Um, so clock source, we already talked about, needs to have them. Um, most, most hardware tokens aren't going to have a clock source because managing that clock source is not really a straightforward thing. Obviously, if you have a mobile phone, you have the ability to connect out to the internet, NTP sync, and get your clocks, you know, clocks you issues resolved. A hardware token is a little bit more of a, a project to make that happen. Um, what, what this all comes down to, though, at the end of the day, is both of those algorithms actually still require a secret key. If you've ever set up Google Authenticator or any other thing that uses top P, you probably have seen a QR code, you probably held your phone up, it scanned it. All that was doing was in the QR code is the secret key. That secret key compounded with the hashing algorithms that top P and top P are using and the clock time or the increment, all smashed together with some concatenation, some uh, other fun crypto. All that's doing is taking that secret key and making that one-time password. Um, that doesn't really matter because, again, you're obscured from that, right? The algorithm, you don't have to know how that works. The QR code, as long as you can hold your phone up like this for a couple seconds and like go like that a little bit, probably, uh, you're going you're gonna to set up two factors. It's probably not going to be a whole lot of uh, effort. Um, best case scenario, of course, is that only you and your server know what that secret key is. And by you, I mean your phone, probably, right? Your phone has hopefully stored that based on the application. Um, a, lot of, a lot of these phones have their own crypt cryptographic store now. In fact, some of, the H or some, of, sorry, some of the Android phones actually have a hardware security module built in now, where it actually stores that crypto key in a tamper, basically tamper proof, because what will happen is if anyone tries to open your phone up, like desolder the chip, it'll basically ruin the chip and ruin your private key at the same time. Uh, so 
It's crazy that in a few years we now have HSMs in these phones when almost none of your servers at your companies that you work for, whether it's a Fortune 10 or a Fortune 500, you probably don't have HSMs in almost any of your servers, but now you have them in your phone. Interesting. Um, the phone's more accessible than the server. But, uh, ab absolutely. Well, that's kind, of, that's kind of the upside and the downside. HSMs are usually only in servers that are not accessible. Yeah. They're like in the corner, in a safe, uh, in the Faraday cage. Yeah. I was about to say, how often are the servers stolen? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's some examples of apps that, that support. So um, uh, here's Google Authenticator on, I think, a an Android screen. Um, here's Android Token, which my basic guess is that's probably the Oath Toolkit, literally just implemented with some UI elements. Um, and that's an older version of our Android uh, dual mobile app. Um, so any of these will do the same thing. They're all just, again, using open standards. Download one. All three of these are free, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but for all those services and many, many more, um, uh, there's actually, I think it's twofactorsauth.org. There's actually a kind of a publicly group sourced uh, list of two-factor sites, or sites that support two-factor, like consumer-facing sites. Uh, and it'll tell you, do they have hardware tokens or do they have software tokens? If it's a software token, it's probably top P. You can probably use it in here. Um, but that's a cool resource to, to look at. Uh, so kind of going through some iterations of, of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, hardware tokens, um, without, a question, without a question, have been dominant for almost three years. It's really only been the last like four or five years that software tokens, mobile apps, have really allowed us to have a mechanism to do um, OTP generation without having a, a keychain token. So 1984, Ken Weiss, he basically created uh, the Secure ID token that we all know today. It got acquired effectively by RSA. Um, and from that, from that time on, allegedly, he coined the phrase two-factor suspect, I don't know. Um, but either way, uh, 1984, that's a long, long, long time ago. And think of, what's, what's funny is you guys had so many people in here that have used a uh, Secure ID token. Uh, I've given this talk a few times before, and it's usually like one person, like in the far corner, that's actually used one. Um, so what's interesting about that is, Secure ID's been around for a long time. Most audiences I talk to, though, almost no one's ever used them or even know what the hell Secure ID is. If you've been in information security or corporate networks or government, you probably know what Secure ID is, uh, but very few people outside of that space uh, rarely do. The hardware tokens, much like other algorithms we already talked about, usually like a 60 second, 30 second window, depending on what the, the hardware token implementation is. Uh, commonly, if it's not RSA, it's probably uh, historically using Hot P as of a few years ago. There's actually some tokens now that are using Top P. Um, it's a little bit more complex, like I said, clock, clock source and stuff. But um, RSA is one of the few proprietary hardware tokens still in existence. Uh, it's not an open algorithm. It's not something that you can implement without having a licensing concern if you reverse engineered it, whatever. Uh, so hot P for most tokens you buy off the market are actually um, the, the common standard you'll see. Um, so there's a bunch of types of tokens. Um, the most common one that most of you guys probably still have is this one. This is older school. There's an older school one than that. Because uh, again, 1984, there's a lot of history with this stuff, right? Uh, Vasco's another popular one. Cisco safe words. Uh, I think Cisco SafeWords is actually now um, hot P. I think they actually converted from their own proprietary one over to uh, being open. So if a service actually does their own two-factor, so um, who uses Basecamp in here? No uh, so who, <laughs> easy, softball. Who uses LinkedIn in here? Yeah, well, yeah it's good. Um, most companies that actually are deploying two-factor right now are doing it via SMS. Because, of course, SMS, a lot of us, all of us maybe, have a cell phone. Uh, SMS is very well understood. SMS text messaging, most of us have like a $5 a month plan for our limited text now. Very easy transport mechanism. Um, the, the, the learning curve, like, so if you have a keychain that has a bunch of numbers on it, you can just read the numbers, type those in, and that's your learning curve, right? The same thing with SMS. You log into a site, it says, I'm sending you an SMS. You look at your phone, there's six digits, you type those in. It's pretty much the same um, level of effort as a hardware token, it's just a de different delivery mechanism, right? Um, traveling and international is a huge problem, though. 
If you've ever traveled international, you've probably uh, done it either without a cell phone or you've had to go to some lengths to get a new data plan and a SIM card and all this other crap, right? Or you've done like call forwarding. However, when it comes to SMSs, that data plan effort probably isn't the, the first thing you want to do if, if you're not going to be there for like a month or something, right? So in the case of SMS, if a service only offers you SMS two-factor and you're an international traveler and not at a rate that you want to pay for, you probably won't enable your cell phone. You'll probably use like Skype or something maybe or, or some VoIP, VoIP thing on your laptop over Wi-Fi. Um, definitely not the most reliable means. The other problem is about the, the international aspect is a lot of the services that offer SMS two-factor are actually U.S. companies and don't offer two-factor for anyone outside of the North, uh, basically North America. So if you are an international customer of a two-factor enabled company that uses SMS and they're based out of the U.S., it's very rare for them to actually allow you to be an international customer and benefit from the added security, which obviously sucks. Um, so a couple of these, like 37 Signals, uh, which is now Basecamp, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Blockchain if you do Bitcoin, Managed WP if you use WordPress, um, uh, the three at the end, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Chase, and Citibank, depending on what account level and the kind of account you have, that might not be true, but most of those are also SMS-only methods of two-factor. Uh, Twitter is interesting because maybe two years ago, excuse me, two years ago, I think they deployed their two-factor for the first time, but when they deployed it, it was actually only for SMS. Since then, they've actually added an in-app version where it actually pushes authentication to your phone, you hit like a check mark and it logs you in. So um, I think we're going to see that more often. We'll see that kind of evolving um, mode as even though we've been doing two-factor since 1984, it's still kind of this nascent thing for like your everyday business, your everyday web service to support. So I think we'll see more companies doing what Twitter did, start with SMS or start with top P and maybe evolve up to a different level and, and maybe some functionality for uh, doing two-factor. Uh, phone calls, much the same. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, the, uh, the SMS based forms, do they tend to be prime-loaded as well? Because while SMS is usually arrive promptly. Uh, your, your point is well taken as if you like Google, or not Google, if, you, if you're on Twitter and you like type in like a service and, you, and like 2FA, two, two like I actually have to for my job look at 2FA to factor all these words, a lot of, a lot of the ang angsty complaints on Twitter are like waiting for my SMS still 45 minutes later and like you know shit like that. So um, yes, that's a huge problem. Time, time boxing SMSs, I've seen some where you'll get an SMS that actually says, you know, welcome to whatever bank, six digit code, please use this within 60 minutes or, or ask for another code. So some of them are time boxed, some of them are. Yeah. Um, the, phone, the phone side is if we think, you know, if we think SMSs is, is, is a simple proposition, uh, phones, is, phones themselves are a simple proposition. Like my mom could use two-factor phone base if it calls her up and says like press one to log in or like here's your six digit code, type this into the thing that says six digit code, she's probably gonna be okay. Um, she still has trouble with SMS, so this is a better proposition for her. The cool thing is, unlike SMS, this applies to both mobile and to cellular, right? You can have, or, or mobile and cellular, landline and cellular. So if you have your landline, you have a VoIP line that doesn't have like any kind of text um, you know, operations like SMS you can still use your office phone on your normal VoIP line and actually get uh, a phone call. Now, how that's implemented, um, Duo, like our company, what we do, we just actually have you press like pound or one or some, some number. Uh, some companies will actually read you off the pin and then you have to type the pin into the website and then log in. Uh, we'll talk about some kind of threat modeling stuff here in a second. The cool thing um, for most people is uh, again, historically, maybe 20 years ago or 10 years ago even, you would have to pay for long distance charges or whatever else. Most of us have pretty much US-based uh, calling plans now for most of our services, whether VoIP or cellular. Uh, fees are not gonna be a huge problem in that case, unlike SMS. Some of the people using your service might not actually have SMS or have to get charged 10 cents per SMS still, maybe. <laughs> um, but again, I think the landline one is the more salient point here. Landlines are, are or VoIP or however you want to phrase them. Anything not uh, smartphone or, or feature phone enabled, basically. Oops. 
this is something that you guys have probably actually used before, and maybe didn't really think about it. You, sometimes you have a you 